Good morning, church. I hope each of you have had a, a, a great holiday weekend, 4th of July weekend so far, and we still got one more day to celebrate our, our independence, so I hope you get to do something fun, celebrate with your family and friends. We are uh, in part two of our little mini-series. Remember what I said a mini-series was only two parts? Last week we talked about baptism. This week we're going to talk about communion. I want to say this last week I have had a lot of conversations with people this week about baptisms. I've had a lot of uh, emails, text messages, uh, in-person conversations. Honestly, I'm really, really glad that this created a lot of conversation between families over the subject of baptisms. Um, we've had people decide that, you know, I need to do this, I need to be obedient, uh, families talking about this. So I'm really glad that we're talking about this, but I, I do want to let you know that these two subjects, baptism and communion, were never designed by Jesus to cause disunity. In fact, they're only to cause unity within the body of Christ, unity of believers. So there was never a, an intent that there should be some sort of division about baptism or communion, but that we should have unity as believers in Jesus Christ. So let's dig right in to the topic of communion today. What is communion? Well, communion is not a word that you're going to find in the New Testament. It's not a biblical term. And they're like, well, why do we use it? Well, communion comes from the word community, which means shared or mutual participation. So the biblical word for community that we find in the New Testament is called koinonia, which means sharing intimacy. And it appears 19 times in the New Testament. So you probably have heard this term koinonia. What that means is fellowship very deep, intimate fellowship with each other. The biblical word for communion actually is the Lord's Supper, which we'll get to that. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Communion is a shared or mutual participation of the body of redeemed believers in Jesus Christ. Some religions call this Eucharist, and that's from a Greek word meaning to give thanks. But Jesus gave thanks, broke bread, and gave it to his disciples, and he raised the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples. This is one of the two ordinances that Jesus asked us to participate in. First, being baptism, and we got to celebrate four baptisms today. Was that incredible? Always remember, uh, you guys that were baptized today, that your, your baptism in Christ is 4th of July. That ought to be an easy one, a day of independence, uh, not just for our country, but most importantly, a, a day of independence in Christ. When did uh, this all start, this, this whole baptism, or the, the communion thing? Did Jesus just think of communion up on, on a whim, kind of like, well, we ought to do this? Well, actually, the roots go all the way back to the Old Testament, into Exodus. When they celebrated the Passover meal, the Passover is when the death angel came and passed through the land of Egypt. The houses and the homes that were spared were those that had participated in the Passover meal and had the mark of blood above their doorpost. And this was a, a celebration that they celebrated every year to celebrate the passing over or the Passover of the death angel. So it goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 as they commemorated the night that the death angel passed over Egypt. So Jesus took something from the Old Testament and gave it all brand new meaning, okay? He didn't just say, hey, we're throwing this thing out. I'm going to take that and we're going to give it something that means something uh, even more special than the Passover. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Let's read beginning with verse 26 on through verse 30. 
While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. When it, he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth. I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the predecessor to communion finds its roots all the way back to Exodus chapter 12. And now Jesus took that old tradition and he's given it new meaning and new significance. So what is the purpose of communion? Let's open up and, and find out what Jesus said about this. In Luke chapter 22, we're going to read verses 17 through 20. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The first purpose of, of communion is, is a memorial. It's because of that statement where he said, Do this in remembrance of me. Very much like as Christians, we have a memorial service for somebody who died. We honor them. We remember them. We celebrate their life. That's what that memorial means to, to us because we're celebrating what Jesus did. There's a lot of different ways people memorialize their, their family, their friends. Some people plant a tree. There are some people that during a holiday meal, they set an empty place and have an empty seat there. Or maybe they put a picture of that loved one there that maybe is off serving in the war or something. So to remember them, to make them feel like they are part of us. My dad, who, who's dead and gone now, uh, left me his Model 12 Winchester shotgun. I love to hunt with that gun. Not my favorite gun, but when I use it, it reminds me that I used to hunt with my dad, and it brings back a lot of great memories. That's what communion is about. It's about a memorial. It's about remembering. We're remembering the life of Jesus. But then it goes further to say that it's fellowship. That's the second purpose of, of communion is that we have fellowship with believers. Now, when we take communion in a few minutes, you're going to have fellowship with every single person in this room. But I want you to know that it's not just within this room that you have fellowship with. You also are having fellowship with those that were in the first service. We're also going to have fellowship with people that are in different churches all over the world. And many of those people, we may not meet till we get to heaven, but yet we have fellowship with them because of communion, because of the blood of Jesus. We get to have fellowship, very intimate fellowship with them because of the blood of Jesus. We practice what um, we call as open communion here. And that means that we don't require that you be a member of this church to take communion because I'll explain that in just a, a little bit, but communion is for believers that want to have fellowship, most importantly with Jesus, but then we have that koinonia, that intimate fellowship with the other believers. Practice of communion is uh, somewhat different than it was 2,000 years ago when when Jesus celebrated the Passover and the first century believers got together and they celebrated communion, most of the time it was done around a meal. Now, I'd be okay if we wanted to have a, a potluck meal or something every week. I'd be completely okay with that. But they were sitting around tables. They were looking at each other in the eye. They were having that koinonia, that fellowship. They were doing life together. And this communion service became part of that meal. Well, we don't serve a meal every week, but we do offer the bread and the wine or the blood of Jesus. The third 
part of a purpose of communion is to celebrate the body of Christ. In this action, we take Jesus. Do you realize there are only two things mentioned in Scripture that allow us to uh, join with the body and the blood of Jesus Christ? Baptism and communion. Those are the only two things that in Scripture we are joined with the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. So we take Jesus. When we take communion, we're taking his name. We identify with him. So in response, we identify with Jesus in baptism, and now we take Christ in communion. There are two parts of the the Lord's Supper, communion as we know it. First is the body of Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you read through the Gospel of John chapter 6, Jesus had just finished teaching what we know of the uh, teaching on the bread of life. And early on in his ministry, he introduced this idea, what he was going to do later as what we know as the Last Supper with his disciples. He introduced this idea that to be a part of me, you're going to have to eat my body, eat my flesh, and drink my blood. Now, this was a hard teaching for them to understand because the Old Testament forbid the eating of meat with blood in it or the drinking of blood. And so this created some some discussion and controversy. Even the disciples said, this is really a hard teaching for us to accept. But he said, if you don't have part of this, you will have no part of me. So they were like, we're going to eat meat and, you know, Jesus' flesh and, and drink his blood. This is really hard to accept. And John chapter 6, verse 66 says that many of those believers deserted and chose no longer to follow Jesus after this because it was such a hard teaching. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, do you guys want to leave and desert as well? It was sometime later at that last supper, he had those disciples, and then he began to, they began to understand, and it made sense what he was saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Second part is the blood. So, like I said, when you read through the Old Testament, you're going to find that it was forbidden to drink blood, to eat the, uh, the meat with the blood still in it. Now... I've often wondered, you know, how they cook their steaks. With may, maybe like many of you, uh, growing up, my parents cooked my steaks until they were done. I mean done. You sometimes couldn't tell if you were eating a steak or the charcoal. Now, Leah introduced me to medium rare steaks. And I'm like, no, it's, gonna, it's got blood in it. Now I love my steaks medium rare. Okay. Now, do you realize, though, according to the Old Testament law, we could not eat that medium rare steak because of the blood. We're under a new covenant now where Jesus says, remember me through this blood. There's a term, and I'm going to try not to butcher it, transubstantination, transubstantination. It's a doctrine of the Catholic Church where the bread and the wine are actually changed into the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And that happens when the, the priest declares that it is now the body and the blood of Christ. And it instantaneously changes. Now, for Protestants, we don't hold to that teaching. We view that the bread and the wine are actually symbols or tokens that represent the body of Jesus that was sacrificed for us and his blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. So the big difference in how they celebrated communion in the first century and now was that it was always that part of a meal together and they ate facing each other. And they also practiced with one loaf in one common cup. Now, maybe you've been to a church or there's still some churches that serve it from one common loaf of bread and one common communal cup. Now, I don't know if they heard of COVID back, back then or not. Maybe it was or it wasn't, but um, that would probably discourage a lot of people from taking communion if you had to take it from a communal cup right now, right? Right? 
That's why we've got these little, little packets here that there are no COVID germs here. You don't have to worry about that. Remember back when we used to pass the trays and things, and uh, that was before we were afraid somebody had a germ on their hand or something like that. Well, they ate one common loaf, and they drank from one common cup. A little different than, than we do today. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about the specifics that the New Testament lays out as far as how the communion service should be celebrated and, and how it's done. The how-tos are really not laid out for us that well uh, in the New Testament. And so because of that, many churches begin to adopt different practices that are still carried out in churches today. So our goal is not to try to create something new, but to try to do something that they did in the first century church when the church began. So why should we take communion? Who should take it? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, begin with verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So who's allowed to participate in the communion service? Who's allowed to say the prayer to bless those elements? Who's allowed to serve it? Is it in special trays? Who's allowed to do this? Do we have to have a certain table? There are two things that we talk quite frequently about, and a lot of questions that come up during our Discover Oakwood and our Commitment 101 is about baptism and communion. I had a discussion with a lady one time was really upset because we had moved a communion table. I said, well, let's find out in the Bible what's, what's it say that the communion has to be served off of? What's it served out of? Who gets to serve it? And guess what? There's really very little instruction in the Bible about that. The one bit of instruction that we have is personal examination. Do you understand that? It's up to us when we take this to examine ourselves. Well, who can administer the right of community? Does it have to be a pastor or a priest or, or an elder? We've actually changed up how we do communion here at our church. We used to, after the service or after the sermon, we had our decision song, and then we'd come out and somebody separate would lead a communion thought, communion meditation and prayer. Now we have just kind of tried to do it as part of our, our sermon. We just found it's a smoother, easier transition to make. Scripture doesn't tell us that it has to be done the first part of the service, the last part of the service, the middle part of the service. So it gives very little instructions on those details. And the Bible also doesn't say that you have to be a member of a particular church in order to join with the believers in the communion celebration. That's why we do open communion, because it isn't our invitation to you. As you read through the scripture, you find it's Jesus' invitation to participate in, in the communion service. He said, do this and remember me. It just says as a believer who has examined himself, and the only real instruction is that we have had to have personally examined ourselves to make sure that we're taken in a worthy manner. Now, I want to tell you this morning, in a few moments when we take communion, if you've got anger in your heart, if you've got some unconfessed sin, if you're feuding and fighting with your spouse, maybe you're mad at somebody in here, don't take it because what's the Scripture say? You're going to eat and drink judgment on yourself. So I'm going to beseech you, don't do it if you are not in a worthy frame of mind today. That happened to me a few weeks back. We always with the praise team... And the worship team, we take communion together as a group backstage before we, we ha have service because, you know, they're playing and we got different parts of it. And we're 
you know, a lot of moving pieces going on. And something that happened, it just kind of spun me out that morning. I can't even remember what it was, but it, it had me so frustrated and so distracted that I, at that moment, when we got ready to take communion backstage, was not in any frame of mind to take communion. So I didn't do it. We're not told that you have to do it, but when you do it, make sure that you do it in that worthy manner. We'll talk more about that in in just a minute. What about the age? How old does a person have to be in order to celebrate communion? This creates quite a bit of controversy in many churches. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that either. We're not told the exact age of the youngest person in the Bible who's taken communion. Many churches don't allow children to take communion until after they're baptized. But guess what? We find no record of that in the New Testament. And in fact, listen to this. The Passover meal was shared by all of the members of the family, even the children. Each one of those children were taught the importance of each one of those elements of the Passover meal. So parents, and especially dads, listen up here. It was up to those dads to teach those kids what the meaning of the bitter herbs was and all the different elements of the Passover meal. Because at some point in time, those kids were going to have a family of their own, and it was going to be important for them to pass on to their children what they were doing. So parents, the great responsibility for us is to make sure that we have taught our kids what is the purpose, what is the meaning of communion. It's not just a snack. We see a lot of parents sometimes allow their kids to take it just to shut them up. Well, I want to take communion. No, you can't. You're not old enough. Ah, they throw a fit. Okay, here, take it. Okay, friends, bring some snacks from home, but don't let them take in an unworthy manner. It's your responsibility as a parent, not ours as a church, okay? Now, we're going to try to teach and help you and instruct you, but as parents, it is your responsibility to make sure that you have taught your kids the meaning and how to take in in a righteous, respectful way the communion. So, parents, if you're just giving your kids a snack do them and yourself a favor and bring them a snack from home but talk to them about communion take away the mystery and instruct and explain that you're not just taking a little cracker and a little bit of uh, juice so that when they do take it they're going to understand the actual meaning of it and it's important it's something very precious. Back when we used to pass the communion trays, we used to have different teams prepare the, the communion, and then the, another team would come in and clean up afterwards. My family did that growing up, and we used the little glass uh, cups. So these, those had to be emptied and washed out and, and dried out, and we always would have to dump out the extra juice. And I remember this very specifically that, you know, we would pour this out and, Dad, we're just pouring this out. How come we couldn't pour this in a cup and drink this? No. Well, Dad, it's just being poured out. It's it's not going to matter. No. Why? Because he taught us how special this was. And it wasn't to be used in as a snack or refreshment, that it wasn't to be used in some kind of a frivolent way, that it was very special. The Bible teaches us that it's for believers who have first examined their self to make sure they have taken in a worthy manner. So that's the greatest instruction about the Lord's Supper is personal examination, period. Well, how often should we take it? That's a discussion. We take it every single week. Well, why? That, doesn't that become just a habit where you just do it? The book of Acts chapter 2 verse 42 gives us a little bit of a a key to that where it says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. There are four elements of 
of their service every time they got together. Fellowship, prayer, breaking of bread, and prayer. That's why we try to do that every single week. Now, we know that they were meeting together almost daily. So this was things that was, were happening daily in their life. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says that they gathered on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. Now, how many of you would like to attend that church that the service went till midnight? Okay, if we just kept going, okay? There was a guy that fell asleep out of the window too, you know, but that's for another whole uh, sermon. Well, they met on the first day of the week. Now, we know that the New Testament believers met on the first day of the week, what we know of as Sunday. Now, a lot of people believe that Sunday is the last day of the weekend, you know, for you get back to the grind of work, that it's the last day of the week, right? No. Sunday is the first day of the week. The first day belongs to God. That's His day. The first part of the day ought to belong to God. The first part of our income ought to belong to God. The first of anything, we ought to give the first of anything to God. And see, the Old Testament believers, they met on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. They didn't want to have any confusion about why we are are doing something different. They met on an entirely different day. They didn't say, you can't meet on the Sabbath. They just said, we're going to meet on the first day of the week. We're going to give the first day of the week to God. So that's why we take communion every Lord's Day, every Sunday. No place in the New Testament does it say that thou shall celebrate communion every time you get together or every single Sunday. But we know for the early church, it was a daily thing. And they met together regularly on the first day of the week. History also tells us that soon after the turn of the second century, churches began to do what we would call a token communion service. Rather than being a part of a meal, they began to celebrate it much like we do now. Now, I would be completely okay if we had a meal every Sunday. You know, I love church fellowship meals. If we had them every week and decided during the middle of that fellowship meal that, hey, we're going to take communion, I would be down for it. I would absolutely be okay with that. I would love that. Well, That was even being abused, and Paul had to address that and said, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't gorge yourself on the Lord's Supper. The Bible doesn't say that you have to have it after an entire meal. So the church began to... After, after some time later, begin to do what we call the communion services, a part of their service where they specifically and intentionally honored the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That they stopped what they were doing and they broke bread together. Well, let's kind of wrap this up, okay? Let's talk about the application real quick. What does this mean for us today? When we take this, and because in just a few moments we're going to take communion together, it means that we need to remember. It's an act of remembering. And Luke chapter 22, verse 19 says, Do this in remembrance of me. That was Jesus' words, that was his instruction. We're to remember the cross, we're we're to remember the suffering that Jesus went through, we're to, to remember the beating, we're to remember the blood. That was shed to cover our sins. We're to remember. We're also to do that personal examination. The scripture that I just read. That we are to examine ourselves. To make sure that we take in a worthy manner. So I want to ask you. Are are you harboring angry feelings today? Towards somebody? Somebody? 
Is there an unconfessed sin in your life that you have hidden from everybody, including maybe your spouse and your children, your employer, your church? Is that sin something you need to confess? What about, is there something in your life that's blocking the relationship with you and God? Scripture is very plain, and it's a stern warning. Don't take it. So if you today can't take in a worthy manner, don't bring judgment on yourself. The third application is is the anticipation that we're going to have the second coming. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, we get to look forward to doing this in heaven. Can you imagine what communion will be like in heaven? I don't know if we'll get to take it daily, weekly, whether it's a one-time event when we all get there, I don't know. But Jesus said, we'll get to do this in heaven. Can you remember your very first communion? And maybe how special it was. I can remember the day I was baptized. It was a special event to have one of the elders of the church come back and serve me while I was still just getting out of the baptistry. Be able to pray with me and and to serve a very first communion service. I can only imagine what it's going to be like in heaven. If you didn't receive a, a little packet of communion as you... Uh, came in this morning just just hold up your hand and we'll we've got some guys at the back that will make sure you get one maybe you slipped in and didn't get one but we're going to do this and those of you that are watching at home hopefully you've made the preparations uh, as well that we're going to take the Lord's Supper together but I want to ask before you take these few moments right now before we do this and we're going to do this as a body of, of believers in unison that you examine yourself and make sure that you partake in a worthy manner so that you don't bring judgment on yourself take these few moments real quickly